there is no place like the cube. Hey, I'm Darren. And I'm Esther. And this is Second Sunday, a podcast about Black queer people finding, keeping, and sometimes losing faith. I was sitting in the pews. Um, it was on a Friday night, and I uh, was sitting in a different seat. I sat more closer to the back of the door um, because now I'm starting to feel like I have no place there. And so it was when my dad got up to start teaching in the pulpit. He called me out by name. He called me by my family name. My biological name is Carmarian, but my middle name is what they call me and my family. And that was his way of getting my attention. And he began to say, you know that this is not of God. You know, God is displeased with your lifestyle. And I cannot be your pastor and condone and allow you to come in here every time the church doors open uh, and make a mockery of the God that we serve and that we worship. And if you don't like the rules of this church and the standard of holiness, then you can end your membership here. And I could see them with my mom back of her head and I could just see the tension in her neck Every time I hear a story like that, like my stomach just ties up in knots. I already want to fight. I'm already in fight mode. (laughs) I'm definitely (laughs) in flight mode. This is a feeling that a lot of people know. Yeah. Because it hurts on so many levels for so many different reasons. It's everything from the public humiliation yes. to the family embarrassment to the isolation. To looking at the back of her mom's head and right. being like, you agree with what's happening to me right now? Let me just, before we get too far into this, I just need to set the scene because this is later on in our conversation. So let me just set the scene. So the voice you just heard belongs to Carmarian Anderson Harvey. She's a Black woman of trans experience and This story is taking place in Dallas, Texas in the 90s. Both of her parents are in church leadership and they're both very active and they're running a church. I was reared in Black church. I was reared Pentecostal in the Grand Old Church of God in Christ. Uh, My dad is a bishop. My mother is a missionary for those that understand those titles. Those are high ranking titles in Black Pentecostal churches. Black church to me was an opportunity to come together and create a form of worship where it provided unity for Black individuals, bring all of our sorrows, but turn it into a form of worship and be motivated doing, you know, those hours. And when I say hours, I mean, you're talking about four or five hours. And we sealed it oftentimes charismatically through a lot of fast music, as well as a lot of shouting, a lot of speaking in tongues things that brought us together to certify that we just didn't come to fellowship, but we actually came to the bar heaven to allow us to receive what we needed until we came back together. If that was going to be Tuesday night Bible study, or if that was going to be on pastoral teaching on Friday or coming back on Sunday. Does that not sound like a lot of church to you? When your parents run something, whether it's a business, whether it's church, you are in that process <laughs> day in and day out okay you did not have an opportunity to opt out of this process <laughs> you don't have a choice to opt out this is you now girl but the thing that I really could feel from Carmarian as she was describing how actively involved she was in a church from a very young age was that she wanted to be there mm-hmm. I didn't get a sense that she was like we had to go to church and d- it didn't nah, feel she was, like she was she being was dragged at all she was part of actively helping steward this ministry so this is a very traditional and conservative environment and as she's talking to me of course I'm feeling some nostalgia because I also grew up in the church but I'm also thinking wait what is it like as a Black woman of trans experience, coming of age and growing up in that environment. I'll use this word 
respectfully, but I always knew that there was something different. There was something different in, in what I saw in my Black church experience, what I saw in my Black experience home-wise, and as well having a brother being an identical twin. And as we were getting much older, how our identities were no longer identical. So around the age of 14, Carmarian reaches out to some teachers about her feelings of being different, and they offered her some level of counseling, and she began to slowly let who she felt like she was on the inside start to show on the outside. I noticed that when I start growing out my hair and I start dressing um, and presenting um, more feminine and walking in the church doors, how that just really shocked my parents. It shocked the congregation. It more or less shocked my parents because it was like they could not address the congregation how they are allowing me to show up. And in so many ways, I was considered very rebellious. I was very clear at that young age that this is who I am. And so, you know, every Sunday I will walk in uh, very proud. I still mounted the drums. I'm a drummer, believe it or not. And did what I needed to do. I still tried to be in the fellowship of the saints by worshiping. I was denied communion. Anytime that I went to go to the altar for prayer, it was never about what I needed at that time of what I'm asking for. It was always a prayer of deliverance and to change my mind and so forth. So there was never no conversation. It's just reoccurring events of rejection We are familiar with the type of tension that comes in the environment where no one's saying directly that they don't want you there, but you can Mm -hmm. feel it in the room. Yeah. It's the plausible deniability for me. We put that all are welcome here banner at the door and then in tiny print, there's terms and conditions that apply. Until your hair grows out too long and then I'm going to do the side eye, but I technically never said anything. And we need you to play these drums. As I'm staring (laughs) you down like viciously. They can't say explicitly that they don't want her around because that would make them have to own their own feelings. You have to own the fact that you want to reject this person who's serving and worshiping here from the church, which doesn't align with who we say we are in Christian faith. But that feeling is still very strong. It's a death by a thousand cuts. And for Carmarian's situation, things eventually came to a head. I was sitting in the pews. It was on a Friday night. In most Pentecostal churches, Friday nights is pastoral teaching night. And so I went to church every time the doors was open. And when the doors wasn't open, I was in the church because I was responsible for cleaning. We live next door to the church. I'm a bishop's kid. But it was Friday night and I uh, was sitting in a different seat. I sat more closer to the back of the door because now I'm starting to feel like I have no place there. So I kind of distant myself. And many folks did show up for Friday versus Sunday So there was a lot of space between us. And so it was when my dad got up to start teaching in the pulpit and he started off with, you know, sharing that he is going to share some things, but he has to do what God has called him to do. And ethically, regardless of the ties or the family bond, he has to be true to his call. And he called me out by name and, um, he called me by my family name. Uh, my, my biological name is Carmaria, but my middle name is what they call me and my family. And that was his way of getting my attention. And he began to say, you know, you know that this is not of God. But, you know, God is displeased with your lifestyle. And I cannot be your pastor and condone and allow you to come in here every time the church doors open and make a mockery of the God that we serve and that we worship. And if you don't like the rules of this church and the standard of holiness, then you can end your membership here and you can get out from the church. In this house, we're going to serve the Lord and we're gonna serve the Lord in how he created us. And I remember when he said that, um, I don't know what type of emotion at that time I had. I think I was more shocked because I felt like I was being outed. But my mom, I was very close to, and I could see my mom back of her head, and I could just see the tension in her neck, how she really wanted to embrace and look at me, but she, she just kept her eyes glued 
you know, to the pulpit. Um, and there was nothing that she basically did, you know, and because of that, in my mind, at that early age, it made me feel that that's also how she believed as well. And so I remember that I packed my stuff up. I was carrying a cute purse that age, you know, purses was in then. With my clog shoes, with my slacks, um, I was not at that time wearing dresses to church. You know, you're talking about three years in my transition, and so I'm still evolving. And I packed up my stuff and I left. And that was the last time for quite some time that they actually saw me. It's 2011 and the Arab Spring is raging. A lesbian activist in Syria starts a blog. She names it Gay Girl in Damascus. Am I crazy? Maybe. As her profile grows, so does the danger. The object of the email was, please read this while sitting down. It's like a genie came out of the bottle and you can't put it back. Gay Girl Gone. Available now. Hey friends, we're having a live event with PRX. And we want you to join us virtually. The PRX Big Questions Project presents Making It, a Night of Big Questions. It's Tuesday, June 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Click the link in the show notes to register today. Imagine living in the same house with somebody and they wait till they get in front of the church on a microphone. A microphone. To tell you how they really feel. A microphone? <laughs> like, no, hey, we've been talking about this. You couldn't just cup your hands around your mouth. You had to use a microphone. You brought technology. There, there were people there to shout and say amen, potentially. There were. Instead of just having a conversation with your own child. Child. But that is the thing that really, Darren, that's why this part made me cry. This part really hit home for me because it was the underlying statement is that it is my duty to publicly shame you. Right. It is my duty to show everyone else that I am rejecting you. Right. Which is why it probably hurt so bad for her mom not to turn around, even to give you some eye contact, like something to hold on to. Right. It's that authoritarian. Her father wasn't a father in that moment. Mm -hmm. He was a church official, right? That was her pastor. And her mother couldn't be her mother in that moment. She had to be the supporter of the pastor. The preacher's wife. And it's like, where is, where is the humanity? Mm. The overlap in this story that her father is also her pastor makes things complicated for everyone involved because her father has kicked her out of the church and she has to walk away from the church, but she isn't kicked out of her family and she doesn't actually want to walk away from her family. Now, did I exit from my parents' home and family functions? I did not. It was very important to me that I separate the two. I'm still desiring mom and dad, and I still desire to be in family and in community especially now that I don't have a spiritual community, which is most times in Bible Belt states and Black families, that's a culture. And so I, I, you know, that culture was taken from me. So the only thing that I had was the fellowship behind closed doors at my family home. We were a praying family. We did actually have our own version of church at home. We were all believers in my household. But more importantly, I also was the cook in my family. So I start cooking the summer before I went into seventh grade. I became the full-time cook for my family, which led me to, to get a degree in culinary arts. I missed that time of cooking and fellowshipping with my family. The other piece is, is that they were rearing my son. Oh, and by the way, Carmarian became a parent at 16 years old. So there are a myriad of reasons why she wants to stay connected to her family. And so in order for me to be able to have that level of fellowship, it was beneficial for me to have it in their household so they could honestly see how I'm engaging and interacting with my own child. And then I wanted to be next to my twin brother, who's my best friend. You know, I already had the church taken from me. I just didn't know what I was going to do with my family. The final piece that I'll say, and I know 
that this is going to sound maybe a little oxymoron because I was very young, but I was taught in the holiness church to have an ear to the spirit. And one of the things that I heard when I was kicked out of the church was, is that do not become invisible. I heard your visibility provides education. I heard that from God. I heard do not make yourself absent from the people who love you because they did. They just did not know how to show that because of the lack of reconciliation with their faith and how they reared me um, as their child. And so when I heard that, I was even more motivated that every chance I got was to be in the presence of my family. We're talking about someone who's in their teens, Mm. you know, what, about 16 years old here? At least. Like, where are you going to go at 16 years old? Who's ready to be an adult in the world on their own fighting at 16 years old? Yes, there are plenty of people who've done it. But this is also that tension that we live in where we're not free and have our own money and able to do all the things in the world to just get up and go. As I'm hearing this story, I'm also thinking about how I remember I didn't know I was being treated badly when I was that age. I didn't know that what my family was doing wasn't necessarily the best or, you know, things like that. I I wouldn't have been in the mindset to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, resist this. Like, in a lot of ways, your family is all you've ever known. That's all you've ever had. So, gosh, it's so hard in retrospect. But in the moment, sometimes you just got to make do. I was desperate to do what I can. There was a period of time that I felt like I lost everything because it got to the point that even though I was seeing my family, attending every blue moon, I even lost their support financially. I lost their support as it relates to advice. You know, here I am, I'm a young adult. And so I showed up to fellowship. I showed up to say I love them. I showed up to cook dinner. Um, I showed up for birthdays, but I never just really got anything back. And there was something that halted that. And that was because I believe, and and I'm sure that other families uh, may have, you know, experienced this. When you are reared in such a strict denomination, your family and church life bleeds together and church takes first priority, mentally and physically. I was desperate for validation. And at that time, I just wanted to feel validated. I wasn't wasn't sure if that was me feeling validated because of my gender expression. But what was more important is me feel validated that I am still a child of God and I'm still called. I am still that same minister that got up every Sunday. And so that was the hard part that I recognized in order to have some level of my parents showing me that they do love me. I had to go the church route and ask for repentance. I needed them. And so I used the altar as an opportunity to suppress maybe what I was thinking at that time to encourage myself that I have to do this if I'm going to be complete and whole and if I'm going to gain my life back. I attempted to detransition. I wound up cutting my hair. Um, I wound up trying to dress as androgynous or as masculine as I possibly could. I went before the church, um, told them that I am still yet saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. And because of that mind, God has given me an opportunity to repent before the church. I kneeled on the altar and cried out and purged is, is a term that we use um, in the holiness type of worship setting. And my father and and my mom, you know, came and embraced me and the church just went up and we had this big, magnificent revival based off my deliverance. This is the part of life that we don't talk about because, you know, a lot of people end up in that situation where they're like, I am the one who needs to take on the burden of keeping Mm -hmm. this thing tucked away. I'm going to (laughs) pretend. I'm just going to go through the motions so that y'all don't reject me. It is very human to feel something when the whole church is dancing and celebrating your return, even if it's cost 
you your very identity. But the thing is about agreeing to pretend to be something that you actually are not is that it's hard to keep up with that emotionally, mentally, spiritually. If you feel like you're living a lie, that's a lot to carry, even if you're getting that validation from the people that you love. This detransition period only lasted a few months because something happened that made her decide that she just couldn't keep going. I was laying down and I was asleep. And I kid you not, and I remember in that vision, I was I was either preaching, teaching, I was doing something that had something to do with some level of ministry. And um, of course, I'm looking out, I'm not looking at myself because I am that person in the dream. So I'm looking out what's scattered. You know, I'm looking out who I'm talking to. And I saw a community, and for the lack of the word, that looked very clowny. You know, like I was in a circus. I don't know what this dream was about or this vision, perhaps is what I call it. But it was just like, I was placed there and I'm trying to share with them about God and the love that God has for all of us. And I remember how my vision became part of the audience. And when I saw myself, I didn't recognize myself because I was like, who is that that is so pretty? Who is that that is just glowing? Who is that 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 is, who is this woman of God, basically? Because I saw a representation of something feminine. I went to bed androgynous and still semi-masculine, but I saw a different, but I knew it was my voice. And from that day forth, made it very clear that I need to live out my truth so my call can fully take root. It may be different than others, I didn't even have a rule book of this, but I was very clear what I heard, what I saw, and I stuck with that. And I did not question it. And I didn't allow the rejection to have me question it. And so I chose to retransition or rather relive my truth. And whatever I lose, I lose. We talk about this a lot. Following God's word is not always convenient but nobody ever thinks that applies to gay people, (laughs) right? Like (laughs) our struggle is not the result of us hearing from God. It was the media that that influenced us. Exactly. We didn't play enough baseball. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) With this spiritual revelation and her decision to retransition and continue her journey to walk in her truth, everything goes back to the way it was. They go right back to how they were acting. Wow. But over time, as Carmarian steps more into her truth, she gains more and more independence from her parents. She graduates high school early. She gets her associates, gets a job with General Motors when she's 18. But even though she's thriving in this way, she's still dealing with the emotional repercussions of her family's rejection. In dealing with that rejection, she attempts to self-transition, struggles with an eating disorder, and picks up some harmful habits. I was still desperate for the acceptance. I was looking also to be loved, so I became very promiscuous. I was no longer preaching. I had really no interest in opening up the Bible, but I was still very clear that I was calm. I love making this podcast because it often feels like we only can ever exist in two spaces. We're either out here partying, living our best life, or we're somewhere in a dark corner hating ourselves, which means that there's just no nuance and no space to acknowledge the complications and the pain of loss and rejection, which means that the people who are dealing with that pain don't have any room to heal from it. They're expected to kind of just skip over that part. So that that stuff doesn't get to just exist by itself in a space where it is sacred and acknowledged and cared for and soothed in a healthy way. These painful feelings, these heavy feelings are where a lot of people get lost. A lot of people stay there. What fascinated me about Carmarian's story is that she didn't stay stuck in that place. That heaviness did not completely take her over she was able to climb out of it somehow with her faith, not just intact, but thriving. 
and I really, really wanted to know how she survived. Want to dive into how technology and Black spirituality intersect? Or confront the challenges new tech is creating? Maybe even catch a vision of hope for the future? Check out Moral Repair, a Black exploration of tech. A podcast about the innovations that make our world and break our societies. And how we can all heal just a bit. Available on Spotify, Apple, and wherever you listen to podcasts. I had close, wonderful best friends in high school. And I had a girlfriend that I hung with all the way through high school. And her family was like my second family. They allowed me to be able just to show up however I showed up. In high school, if I needed to dress masculine just to leave the home, I would go to her house before we went to school and change into my clothes that I know that's going to make me comfortable and then go to school. They um, attended a Baptist church, which was right around the corner from my parents' church. That particular pastor and my dad were very good friends, even though we were two different denominations. Um, In the city I grew up in, it's very small. Everybody know each other. And so I wind up asking them, do you think it will be comfortable for me to come to church with them? And they was like, absolutely. We'll pick you up as such and such and so forth. And I was like, no, I have a car um, now, so I'll just drive myself. Walking through those doors and my truth in a new environment for the first time was like remarkable to the point that I went back the next Sunday in my truth. I sat in the family section of my uh, best friend, her mom, her mom's sister, husband, kids. When you first enter a new environment, after being in an environment where you felt like Nothing that was true to you is possible. It's that first moment where you're like, oh, I have a clean slate. Mm. I can be whoever I want. Mm-hmm. And it is not a given that I am going to be rejected. Right. Like, that's that's what we often have to do. We have to pick the people who are also willing to pick us. And mm. we can transform situations just based on the connections that we have. We have to pick the people who are also willing to pick us. Oh, yeah. That's real. <laughs> that's the truth. It's transformative. Mm. And, you know, that that's what that's in, in my world, in my hopes for the future. That's what I want everybody to have. It's like, you know, I'm not out here trying to tell you what your theology needs to be. Mm. But I do want to see everyone able to find a community, to find a spiritual center, to find a, a, a family that they can fully be present in and that they can fully belong in. I didn't think that was possible. And that is what started my journey of wholeness, healing and wholeness. After about a month there, she asked the pastor if she can join his church temporarily. And this is church speak, but bear with me for a second. If you're not Baptist and you want to join a Baptist church, you essentially have to go through a process where you convert to being Baptist. Now, Carmarian doesn't want to fully convert to being Baptist. She just wants some license to attend the church temporarily. And the pastor doesn't only say yes, but fully supports her. I walked out of that office and that changed my life. So I joined the choir. I led songs. Then the pastor said, the women's department is going to come to you with an ask. I think it'll be good for you to do it. I don't know what, what that meant. And they asked me for celebrating annual Women's Day if I will emcee the service. And I emceed the service in all white. And I didn't know what they were expecting, but I just brought what I brought. And I brought that charismatic Pentecostal filler to my MC. And the pastor was just so elated that, you know, he got up and acknowledged him. That is how you MC a church. Now I'm like 19, 20, or maybe 21 years old. When I first joined the church, when I shouted, I spoke in tongues, I could hear the pastor in the pulpit when he preached and said, you know, kind of, kind of the soft rebuke that we don't believe it takes all that. But I remember when I finally understood the hymn Amazing Grace and I got up hooking and bucking and speaking in tongues, I heard the pastor say, leave her alone. She finally gets it. I also don't want to 
oversimplify this moment because I did have to shorten it for the sake of this episode. Every single person in the church is not on the same page about Carmarian's presence, but she did have the full support of the pastor and a ton of her new chosen family. Overall, it was a very positive experience for her. Most importantly, when she decided that it was time to leave the church on good terms this time, it led her to her next chapter in ministry and eventually led her back to her family's church. I was definitely like, okay, this is a happy ending for me. She's found a chosen family, but there was still a part of me that was like, I want to know what's going on with her biological family. I want to know what the status is of the relationship with the people that had originally rejected her. Now that she has her own money, she's a new person, and she's in a different environment, is she still connected to her family and her family church in any way? When I would go back and visit my parents' church, um, I was still a little timid. I was still a little distant. I was still, I was still come in late, and I would still leave early. But as I became older and more mature in my relationship with God, and understanding a little bit more clear about my call, and now belonging to a ministry that affirmed all of me, gave me that empowerment that I needed to show it very boldly. I didn't have a problem raising my hands to worship. I didn't have a problem still speaking in tongues and not flinch and worrying about who's looking at me. My mother became my best friend. Um, My mom was my advocate. My mom told my aunt that she always knew, but she blamed herself she blamed herself because she she feels that she raised me too soft. It's in, it was her words. But she always knew. But she did not know how to accept it because her main fear was she couldn't protect me. If we would have had that conversation early on, I think my journey would have been a little bit lifted. But where I stand today, I'm grateful that I went through all of that. My dad, you know, it's a little bit different because they could be very hyper masculine. But just when he would invite me and say, you're going to be there this Sunday evening, right? For the church anniversary. That was reconciliation. Darren, does that not sound like a black parent apologizing to you? <laughs> You want some food? Okay, you coming to church? All right, right. come on in. We're not going to talk about it, but we show sure enough going to be indirect and express concern or care in some kind of way. Oh, Lord, help us all get therapy. <laughs> hey, I mean, coming from his generation and from that context, it took a lot to even get there. So I'll take it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it, it seems like that came from a very how long it took to get there is not lost on me. Truly. And that, you know, there's there's so much to be said about the impact of people who are invisible leadership taking a step toward others, whether that's Mm -hmm. showing up, inviting somebody for a meal, or just welcoming folks back. Like, we really do have the power to change the narrative. By now, Carmarian is in her 30s, fully independent. She has her son full time and she's confident enough to go to her parents' church and still is following, actively following her call to ministry. But then my dad got sick and he got diagnosed with cancer. And in his last iteration of his health challenges, his bishop over him made a request to all of his kids that were in ministry to come back and support my mom in order to keep the church alive. Because oftentimes when you are a founder of a church, you run the risk of the church being split apart because the founder, you know, um, is no longer accessible, present, and it's about to die, essentially. And my siblings was all for it. They's like, absolutely. 
I went to the bishop and pulled him aside and said, I would love to come back. I said, this church affirms me now, but I need some insurance. <laughs> I need that you will recognize my call of everything that I've sacrificed and I've earned up until this point. I want something. So if I have any challenges, I can whip out your permission that you are allowing me to operate in ministry in this denomination. And he said, you will have some license by the end of the week. And if anybody have any concerns, you tell them to come see the bishop. After we buried my father, I stayed for a couple more weeks. And Gary, to my father's month anniversary of his death, my mom had a heart attack and died herself. And um, thank goodness I had the family support, the friend support, ministry support. Um, but I more or less, I had the support of my peace knowing that we all had an understanding and that my parents truly loved me and respected me and truly understood that they cannot question what God has created and what God has called me to do in the earth because they began to see the fruits of my boldness, my truth, my authenticity, and my labor because they then start accepting saved and loving people and gender expensive people as members in their church. Wow. Wow. There is just, there's so much more to Carmarian's story. I don't know if we need to drop some bonus episodes because <laughs> we end up talking about a lot more from her experiences with her mom, taking her under her wing and teaching her how to navigate misogyny in the church to her experience raising her son as a black Christian woman of trans experience. But we had to stop somewhere, girl, because, you know, I cried through the entire episode. Darren, Hello. say something. It's, it, it is so much. I'm hoping that when people hear this, that they feel seen, right? Mm. That they get a chance to see some of their own family dynamics, some of their own church dynamics, or maybe it fills in the blanks for that person who left the church at some point when they came out, uh, that person who was put out of the church. Mm. Like our stories don't end with the last time that we thought about that person. And it's the opportunity to connect those dots, to see what really matters to people, to get get inside their heads for a bit and inside their hearts and see how God is moving, that I think we all are empowered to find the part that we play in making the church and making the world a better place. The Second Sunday Podcast is hosted by Esther Coro and Darren Calhoun. But podcasting is a team sport. So a big thank you to our dream team. Our producers, Esther Ikoro, Anna Deshawn, and Nicole Hill. Our associate producer, Amber Walker. Our sound designer, Florence Barrow Adams. And our managing producers, Jocelyn Gonzalez and Courtney Florentine. Our opening theme song is Maya B's original track titled, They Don't Know. You should download the full song today. To learn more about today's guests or the show, visit our show notes. Second Sunday is a production of The Cube in partnership with the PRX Big Questions Project, which is generously supported by the John Templeton Foundation and produced by PRX Productions. The Cube is your number one curated platform to discover the best BIPOC and QTPOC podcasts. Support this show and more like it by joining The Cube app and follow The Cube across social media at The Cube app. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next episode. From PRX.
Next.